Hi, Colin Marshall here, letting you know that you can now read a new essay from my upcoming book, A Los Angeles Primer, each and every week at KCET Departures. For details, visit colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Season 3 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. Since you interview a lot of rappers, let me ask you this. Just tally up in your mind how long, how much of your life have you spent waiting for rappers to show up? <laughs> Say uh, 36%, according to the Wu-Tang statistics. Um, I, you know, I'm also always late. I think I've, I've the more inter- rappers I interview, the more frequently I'm late. But right. I think that's maybe that's why I identify with rappers, because uh, my family is... is habitually late always <laughs> my dad was never on time for anything ever mm. and when you're a young kid you get really infuriated and then of course you become your parents right, and right, right. so i don't mind so now i just start showing up 20 minutes late to all my interviews because i assume that everybody's gonna be 20 minutes late right. the only rapper i think i've ever interviewed um the most timely rapper i ever interviewed was bus driver actually and i'll never forget because i was interviewing him i think he wanted to do it at cast Law cafe up the street mm. and so for like and he's like I'm running five minutes late, so I, I live really close, so I was, um, okay, well, I'll be there in 15 minutes, and he showed up actually five minutes late, so. It's only, pretty only five minutes, but it varies genre to genre, right? Musicians, depending on what music they do, that affects the lateness that they will inflict upon you, right? Rap, rap has got to be the worst. Rap is bad, yeah. Rap is bad, because I think, um. Does it extend to all of the pillars of hip hop or just the rappers I, think I should be clear that it has nothing to do with race right I mean uh, white, white rappers are white late. rappers will always be late right. too it, it's a it's a rap <laughs> thing it's not a um it's it's not a race thing mm-hmm. it's just it's just uh I always say that there's like a rapper gene mm-hmm. and um you know I talked about some some of my friends that are rappers and there's definitely a rapper gene because to be a rapper I mean for the most part you know obviously there's exceptions where there's people um you know who are more emo and insecure. But, you know, you think of the, the stereotypical rapper, at least, or the, the quintessential rapper. They're always very confident. Mm. It's like, you know, we, we like rappers the way we like our presidents. You know, like when Jimmy mm. Carter was like, wearing a national <laughs> malaise and like yes. a sweater, everyone's like, get him out. Right, right, right. Whereas you got to be a figurehead of power. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and I think a lot of... So when I think you are a confident, arrogant person who kind of has a kind of they're the center of the universe you tend to be more late because me i don't even think i'm important at all i just happen to be the worst estimator of time (laughs) i'm like oh that will take you five minutes and it always takes me 10 minutes but it's habitual it is notebook on cities and culture i'm colin marshall coming to you from franklin hills in los angeles speaking with jeff weiss writer for the la weekly we know him best as that here in los angeles i think he writes about music about musicians even beyond just rappers he's written for a bunch of other publications as well though he's also founded the site the passion of the weiss and the uh, he's, he's also a podcaster he's done a bunch of stuff there's stuff that i don't know about that i didn't even get to research i'm sure that we're going to unearth but people recently read from you in the weekly uh, a story about Tyler, the creator of Odd Future, who has, as they say, blown up him and his whole collective, Odd Future, have blown up. They've become, for better or for worse, it seems like, in the national zeitgeist, representatives of Los Angeles. Would you agree? Um, I think there is something to, to that. I, I think if you look at the history of Los Angeles, there's always been this kind of... Um, this few, a, a, an idea of fusion, at least since the 60s. You know, I, I always think of the archetype of Los Angeles band is love. That's, mm. you know, my pick. Right. Because love, you know, I always think of them. Arthur Lee, guy grew up in the hood. Uh, you know, he was a mixed race, but I think uh, most of his ancestry was, was African American. You know, you had uh, Brian McLean, who grew up in Beverly Hills mm. and, like, was friends with Liza Minnelli growing up, and, like, they used to swim together. You have Johnny Eccles, um, another dude who kind of grew up near Arthur Lee in the hood. You have uh, the guy who, I think his name is Ken Forsey. He wrote the bass line for, uh, he was the bassist on, on Wipeout, you know, that mm. surf rock yes, song. Yes, yes. So it's like all these, you have the surfer, you have the Beverly Hills kid, you have the hood dudes, you have, and you have a little bit of mariachi music coming in through Brian McLean. Right, right. You had everything, and I think Odd Future. You know, obviously, all the all the rappers are black, but I mean, if you look at like Tyler and who he hangs out with, it's a lot of like white blonde kind of surfer kids, and right. and like 
they he's obviously taking from a bunch of different ideas. You have the Fairfax kind of skateboard thing, which yeah. is even if you look at the Fairfax neighborhood, you know, when I was growing up it was like an Orthodox neighborhood. Right, and remnants are still there. I'm there all the time. You're there's the kosher deli across from Odd Futures clothing store, right? Totally, yeah. They, I mean, they would always go to Canners. They were, you know, they would go to Canners, and you have, the, you know, the pizza place, and you have like, you know, rabbinical supply stores right there, you know, and just the guy, and you, you have your skate, you know, your streetwear boutique. So, I mean, it's always. I think, I think LA is probably. I, I forget. I was talking about with No Can Do. I think on our podcast, and he was he was saying that. You know, everyone has a bunch of different ideas because it's neighborhood by neighborhood. Some neighborhoods are, are really segregated. Some na- neighborhoods are really integrated. I mean, this neighborhood, I, I think, happens to be like a really integrated neighborhood, mm. you know. Uh, but I do think that they are very representative of Los Angeles because they – there's like a certain experimental thing that I think comes with being in like the West. You're not kind of – it's by nature you're not bound by like – there, I mean, theoretically, it's always newer. You know what right. I mean? Like, you go here, there's not that sense of history. Mm-hmm. We are the, the end of the line in some yeah, sense. like, you're at the end of the earth, you know? And, like, I, I you know, I, I read, uh, you know, I took some, I took an L.A. history class, and I always think back to Carrie, uh, Carrie McWilliams. Mm-hmm. That was his name. Mm-hmm. Um, you might have to correct me. Carrie, he, had, he had a book That's about a- California. So, and he... He actually was the guy who uh, was responsible for Hell's Angels, actually, by Hunter Thompson. He was the editor at The Nation. So, oh, I didn't know. Yeah. And he, he's he got this great quote about, uh, you know, I, I don't even want to try to quote it because I'm going to mangle it. But it was basically just, it's the it's the place for, like, freaks and eccentric nut jobs. I mean, you have, mm-hmm. a couple of miles from here, you have Amy Semple McPherson's temple, the Angelus Temple. You know, she was the first, like, female evang- evangelical. You always, you know, El- like, I'm down the street from the Scientology Center. Mm-hmm. You, it's always and like you know Tyler is not he's not a cult leader but he is sort of a cult leader you know like yes. I mean my 13 year old cousin I mean I quoted her in the story but it was funny like I remember like out of nowhere she like added me on Instagram like a year and I was like oh god my 13 year old cousin with the piercings <laughs> and I was like I do not it begins I was like god do I tell my uncle I was like I'm not gonna rat on my cousin <laughs> but yeah and it was just like I heard odd future right. and so then you know he they he they relate to him and I guess the question with odd future is you know I've gone back and forth on them a bunch of times like I loved them at first and then I really didn't care much for Goblin and then you know I really liked Wolf a lot, the new album, yes. and he. I guess the question with Odd Future is: Are they the kind of group that you'd like when you were fourteen, or hate when you were fourteen? <laughs> and that was always the question. And then I, I finally have decided that I would have really loved Odd Future when I was fourteen. And you have to put yourself into the mind of yourself at fourteen, which is it's that's a little bit of a harrowing experience too, isn't it? Is, is it how possible is it? <laughs> it's you know it's it's not that possible. But what you know, were you listening to when you were fourteen? I had great taste. <laughs> I would say that. I always talk about that. Uh, was it? I was like Wu Tang. I was like I, I was a basketball player and a baseball player, so I would always make these mixtapes for myself. Um, I was really into the Fugees my freshman year of high school. I was really into Wu. Uh, I was really into Mob Deep. I was really into. Um, you know, I didn't really realize rock existed like on any kind of meaningful level right. until like except for the Doors. I was you know growing up in Southern California. You're always it's, it's, it's funny. Like, I think we're the same age, and growing up, you we, you could be white and only listen to rap, totally. and it was it was so abundant. You would you'd never run out of music, even though we had no file sharing. It's like I can go forever on just rap from this year. Totally. I well, I, I had a system because you know I, I my parents weren't about to like be like, oh, here's fifty dollars. Go go have fun at the record store. It was like oh, fun at Tower when that was real. Yeah, I would never shop at Tower because that shit was all new. And like I was like, I need to buy you CDs. Yeah, I'm not gonna pay eighteen ninety five for uh, I was like genuine I, or whatever. I was like six ninety nine tops. Where can I get a six ninety nine mm-hmm. CD? And Rhino, lots of places here, I would imagine. Rhino Records was really good in Westwood, of course. I like every record store. Now, like uh, the warehouse in Westwood, I used to go to a lot. Um, I used to go to Music Plus in Beverly Hills because they would have. When I was really young, they would have three tape singles for nine dollars, and I thought that was just the greatest thing ever. And then you'd buy three tape singles, and sometimes it'd be a bust. And they also had this one thing. It was like it was like seven ninety nine, and it was like. Where like where or it was music plus like recommends and like your money back if like you don't like this tape. So did you ever take them up on that? No, I never did. No. I like I bought I bought a lot of tapes, but I never took them up. I felt like I think I like felt I wanted to. Like, I remember I bought the Rex and Effects album when oh, I was in yes. the fifth grade. <laughs> that was I was really into that. I bought 
but En Vogue, Funky Divas, mm-hmm. which is a great album. Uh, I will stand by that. It's had a little bit of a renaissance. People are appreciating early En Vogue, I think, I'm now. I'm totally okay with this, like, we are appreciating. Like, like yeah. if, like, I like that Tyler, the creator, like, will reference, like, Jeanne or, like, right. yes. Jade or something. I'm like, you know what? How can you hate anybody who's, like, that young? And, like, I, what I like about them, I guess, is they, I mean, it's such a, so trite to say they don't give a fuck, but I think it had been... There had been a moment where everyone... I like I like any artist that tr- does their best to kind of not be cliche. I right. think that's, like, very important because we, you know, as, like, a writer... I, f- I mean, I, there's a great uh, Martin Amos quote where he was, like, writing as a war against cliche. Mm-hmm. And I it really... Was, yes. I, he named a collection of reviews after that, didn't he? I think so, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's such a great line because it's just, you know, I think... I mean, and I'm totally guilty of cliche. Everyone everyone is guilty of cliche. I mean, I'm sure... Unless you're inventing your own language, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to have my own Esperanto. <laughs> but I, you know, what can you do? But you have to at least, I think... It, like, there's a way you can, I think, acknowledge cliche and be, I mean, like, I, I've been talking to people and, like, so many cliches are true, so you can't be, I mean, it's a cliche, I mean, it's become a cliche in its own right to be anti-cliche, so right, right. I just think, um, you know, but I like that about them in the sense that they were trying to, you know, he has a verse on that song, Rusty, on the new album, which I actually hadn't heard when I interviewed him. I like that they, I actually was really happy that they didn't give me the CD beforehand, because I was like, if this sucks... You're gonna have to write in the LA Weekly in a cover story that yeah. No. But you were able to quote Tyler saying the album sucks. Yeah, I was great. not sure whether he was. I mean, he, he just says stuff. So he's really smart. He's a lot. There was the the most telling quote from Tyler was like, I was like, what do you want people to know about you? And I, that's usually a question I always ask people in interviews, and because. Uh, my F. Scott Fitzgerald the cat is is here for the interview. I'd like to inter- interject. Um, yes, yes. He's going to come in, but uh, he's a lot more literary and profound than I am. But uh, yeah, no, he and I was like, "What do you want people to know about you?" And he was like, "He's like people think I'm a, he's like people think I'm a moron, you know, the gravel voice." <laughs> yeah. And he's like, "But I'm smarter than they all are." And I was like, "Yeah, you are." He's but, definitely a rapper. Listen to that quote. Yeah, yeah, and he is smarter than probably everybody because he no one has manipulated the media quite like Tyler the Creator. I mean, it was. Like, you know, it, I, I think I, I wrote a review of, like, uh, The Odd Future Volume 2 tape, and I don't know if you've seen Get Him to the Greek. Have you seen that movie? Uh, I haven't seen it, no. I saw a lot of posters for it. I'm pretty partial to Get Him to the Greek. A lot of people hated that movie, but I think it's hilarious. I mean, maybe it's because the music movie, you know, and, like, there's such a dearth in them. Right. But, <laughs> and he's, like, there was this scene where Puffy is, like, uh, you know, Puffy plays, like, this, like, label, uh, you know, mogul, fittingly, and he's, like... You see that right now? I'm fucking your mind. And, like, Tyler's, like, one of those people that fucks people's mind. And, like, I think he was able to kind of... When he was saying, you know, he's tweeting, it sucks. Because he knew that, you know, he... Like, you know, I don't th- I don't, th- I don't think Tyler... I mean, maybe he is that calculated. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if he is that calculated. Because he's one of those people who, I, I, like, you know... Obviously, they're not on drugs. Because, like, people are like, are they on drugs? I'm like, if he, that guy was on drugs... Because his mind is firing constantly. So, it just would just... It wouldn't do anything. And I think he just knew that, you know, he'd been so hyped. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's no one more hyped than Tyler the Creator. So by saying it sucks, you totally diffuse it. People have low expectations. And if it turns out to be really good, then, you know, you're going to get credit for it. Whereas if you're like, my album is the greatest album. I mean, I think I remember when the Killers did that for their second album. Mm Sam's Town or whatever it was called and Brandon Flowers is like this is one of the greatest albums in the last 25 years and like honestly it wasn't that bad it wasn't a good album but like you're just you hear that someone's saying that and you're like go fuck yourself Brandon Flowers they can only disappoint yeah Yeah. like I was like you're the guy that ripped off Blur for the boys who like girls song like come on like I'm like I'm sorry like I know Americans haven't heard Blur that much but Coachella this year will prove you wrong Brandon Flowers (laughs) Tyler, the creator of Odd Future, is about a decade younger than us, I guess. And, yeah. and you mentioned your 13-year-old cousin. And I wonder, it seems like it's a cliche that maybe trend pieces say in magazines, but I think it's true. Now in the 21st century, kids can listen to whatever they want. Whereas even we, if we listened to Wu-Tang, we weren't listening to the Diggable Planets. We certainly weren't listening to uh, Run DMC. We were listening to what was new right then. Now... I don't know what your finger is on the pulse of kids these days, but uh, they listen to all stuff, right? I mean, everything's open. 
Yeah, I mean, I would I would probably actually say that there is definitely an easier access for them to listen to all decades. I mean, like, I remember being in eighth grade, and, you know, I, I did say earlier that, you know, but I remember I had a Beatles record. Right. I had... Well, you're a music writer. Yeah. But, I mean, friends yeah, who were not, didn't grow up to be music writers. Oh, lucky ones. <laughs> <laughs> um... They, yeah, I think it's it's so easy to get music now. So it's like, you know, you can bury yourself in a decade. I think, I think, but I think there is always that sense that you don't want to hear what your older brother was. I remember when I was, you know, I, I think I started getting into music and the first real time I remember music, like loving music, like when it wasn't like Vanilla Ice or like MC Hammer or like, you know, Young MC, Bust a Move, right. which I mean... To be fair, those are all three great pop singles. I mean, especially Bust Bust Move is a great song. Mm. But um But I, I guess I didn't you know, I didn't like I remember hearing I got a run DMC tape when I was it was like I think nineteen it was when they hit Down with the King and I really liked oh, that. Yeah. But that was because it was a Pete Rock beat. And then if but if you played me like rock box or something, I would have been like, Yeah, I'm not I'm not fucking with that. And still like to this day, this is like totally like but I'm not you know, obviously I, I like like Rakim. You know, Rakim's got amazing singles, mm-hmm. but that's never gonna be my music. And I understood when Tyler, like someone like Tyler was like I remember he was like, Stop asking me about nineties rap, I don't wanna hear about nineties rap. It was partially because, you know, he saw himself, I think, as, like, he didn't want to be pin- pigeonholed as a nostalgist, like, say, like, a Joey Badass or one of those kids, but, you know, or a Mac Miller. And, but, you know, there's a viable market for that now. I mean, a lot of these kids today are, like, 90s nostalgists. You know, I was at, I was at Paid Dues, and, you know, this kind of corroborates what you were just saying, but I was at Paid Dues, and, I mean, the first line of my review was, you know, tie-dye is no longer the preferred shade of nostalgia. It's the Wu-Tang logo. Yeah. And Weird. Yeah, it was, I mean, to me, the '90s just ended because I was in high school then. Yeah. Like anybody, even you know, a sixty-year-old, whenever they were in high school, that time only ended recently, right? You know what I mean? Psychologically. Yeah. I mean, like I, the best music ever will be when you're fourteen. <laughs> like it just is going to be the best music ever. I think. Like, again, I was talking. I was like, you know, you were on Tyler, but he was like talking about 2006, right? And that was what well, I guess that was seven years ago now. So he would have been he's 22, so he would have been 15 years old, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing basically. But he's like, oh man, 2006 was the best, and. I was like, actually, 2006 was probably the worst. Yeah. And it, like, I was gonna say, it was the worst. But, you know, like, you know, he, he heard Hell Hath No Fury. So for right. him, that was, blew his mind because, you know, he hadn't. I mean, I'm sure he'd heard Lord Willing, but, you know, you, you always are gonna like what is yours. Mm-hmm. You know, you're always gonna like what's yours the most because it's yours. Mm-hmm. And I think if you, um, but to be fair, like, there's plenty of kids, you know, now that I'm sure are like, obsessed with Wu-Tang they're obsessed with um, psychedelic rock there are I think I think it's like people music critics especially want to say oh there's no golden eras everything is subject you know it's all but it's that's bullshit there is definitely golden eras oh, yes. and a lot of it is aesthetic we could say there's. it's not that there's no golden era it's that there's so many golden eras there's for so many different eras. overlapping golden eras different genres yeah. have golden eras like you know like there's it, like five golden eras right this second that will end Next week, probably. completely, yeah, and or at least you know maybe two, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean like in the you know in the late sixties, it's like I mean come on, like if you listen to cl- like psychedelic rock made between like sixty six and like seventy, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Like and even like you hear the Nuggets compilation, those are like not good artists, but that aesthetic <laughs> is so like it's aggressive and primal and this distorted and muddy and it it just hits you in a certain place. It's like you know you can hear like. A group home album, right? I always say like that, and everyone like it's like the always album that every rap fan points to, where it's like the worst rappers in the best production because Premier just gave like his best beats to a guy named like the Nutcracker. Sure, um, and you know they're not that terrible rappers, but they're not good. But it sounds so good now because that aesthetic is so you know it's just so raw and like I mean that's just my personal taste or if you listen to jazz from like you know jazz has a bunch of you know you could be a bop guy you could be a, like a cool jazz guy mm-hmm. me personally I like the psychedelic fusion stuff I like I like that and I like soul jazz mm-hmm. but I mean you know but it's it's interesting too I mean because you because a lot of people would call 1988 the golden era of rap it depends on when you were born if you're born in 1975 1988 is your golden era if you're born in 1980 1995 is your golden era. 1994 is your golden era. So take your birth year and add 13 to 16 years to it, and there you, that's your that's formula. That's your golden era, you know. <laughs> and it's just funny how that is. I don't know if it works like that with with other kinds of art. I think it's something weird about music that does that. Mm-hmm. It's not like anyone's like, oh man, the art, the you know, the paintings that came out when I was 14 years old were amazing. Like right. the books, like <laughs> think about it. You're not like, okay, well, if I was born in like the end of 81, so 1984, you're not like. 
man. Like we were like, okay, Bosco was cool from the '80s, or you know, you know, Keith Haring, or whatever. You know, right. no one's like you know, or Picasso. It doesn't matter. Like it could be. You know, TV shows, not, I don't think so. The, uh, TV shows don't age well. I think, like, a lot of people go back and, like, I love Family Ties when I was a kid. I couldn't watch a fucking episode of Family Ties. Right. And I'm, like, a Michael J. Fox apologist. Like, Teen Wolf <laughs> is, like, my favorite movie, practically. Right, right. Um, and I can quote Teen Wolf verbatim. I mean, I've just seen, you know, Secret of Success. I mean, I love Michael J. Fox. But you wouldn't go back and be like, man, you know, like, that's really what's like. You wouldn't go back and be like, Charles in Charge is what's up, <laughs> you know? But you can go back and be like, hey... You know, liquid swords is like the shit. Or uh, you know, I'm thinking of movies. You know, movies too. I mean, it's not even comedy. I mean, nothing ages worse than comedy, but except for Woody Allen. Woody, I mean, some comedy is good. I mean, Peter Sellers movies have aged well in terms of comedy, but you know, some of the great style of Charlie Chaplin. But it's not like that. I don't think. Like you know, no one's going back. I think and being like, wow, Total Recall is. Just, I mean, they're gonna remake it anyway. So it's they like, already did. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But uh, they. I did go to a screening. This is why I love being in Los Angeles, because I was able to go to a screening of the old Total Recall at the cool. Egyptian yeah, cool. when the new one was out. Paul Verhoeven, the director of the old one, showed up and uh, slagged off the new one. Really? Uh, yeah. So, that's you know, great. it's the moments you get in this city. But Starship Trooper is a great film, too. That's That's been revised in, in the critical mind recently. I as like well. that the moment I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go on the record. Right. You were ahead of the curve. Uh, yeah. If only we were recording this in 1998 or whatever. That and Spring Breakers, there's probably an essay to be written about the two of them, because they both have kind of like that like is this real, is this satire kind of aspect is this either the worst movie ever made or is the satire well that's I mean people say that about Odd Future as well right is this is this a joke is it so freakish is it a joke or is it for serious well, you know a song like like bitch suck dick like that's pretty clearly a joke you know what I mean like the, it's a bad song I don't think it's a good joke but it's clearly a joke but then you have um Little B, I think, is more of a, like an example of like, is this a joke? And like, I think the answer is sometimes it is a joke. Riff Raff, is this a joke? Like, Riff Raff is very often joking, but he, I don't think, considers himself a joke. Mm. You know what I mean? And there's like a very like a joke stir. I don't yeah, know. I mean, I've interviewed him, and like, I mean, that was a trip because I'm like in his apartment, and like, there's like rolled up dollar bills and like bills <laughs> on the table, and I'm like, you are living, and it's like a one bedroom, like single apartment with like a like a like a ceramic lizard on the wall, and you're like his like little, and you're like, okay, I know this is not a joke because your closet is way too neat. <laughs> like, there's no way you're joking if your closet is that. You know, like you are. There's something that you know what you're doing. Like it's you know you are joking, but you yourself. Or not a joke because if you were a joke you know unless he hasn't made in which case you know but <laughs> I mean, you know. now I want to get a sense of I mean there's you, you write about different musicians each week in the Bizarre Ride column and the, the names that come up the references you make you know we, we've mentioned Tyler, Tyler the creator a lot he comes up but names like Flying Lotus who's also well known not as well known but well known whom I like um, Dame Funk uh the, what what uh, Matthew David? What what genre am I describing? What traditions am I describing? You're throwing these names out. These seems like seem like super Los Angelesy guys, all of them, and their music seems super Los Angelesy. But that's where my description of why runs out. Maybe you, yeah. I'm sure you know better. I think there's a thing in Los Angeles that there's a lot of artists that um, there's a vein that I think everybody from about the age of 30 and like to 40, you know, Matthew David's maybe 28, 29, but you know, maybe 27 to about 40. Whereas I think everybody come of age with hip, came of age with hip hop. Mm-hmm. And then I, I'm actually doing a big story on Adrian Young and it's kind of somebody who's 34. So it's kind of a similar thing. I don't, are you familiar with his stuff? Only a little bit. Actually, I don't know if the listeners will be, so maybe a little bit of description. Okay, yeah. Adrian Young is a, uh, he's like a, almost like a psychedelic soul musician, you know, and but it's, it's kind of, he does a new album with Ghostface Killer where he very, like when, you know, when I'm saying it, he's, you know, he's kind of looks like a little bit like a young Curtis Mayfield, but he makes music that's somewhere between like Portishead, Air, early Wu-Tang, and uh, a Neo Morricone, which is uh, not to say that he's on that level, but you know, that's the, the influences he's drawing from. And he's a very talented guy and I like his stuff a lot. And but so basically, what we're talking about is you have this generation that sort of came up of age on hip hop, whereas previously, you know, the, if you look at the early um, the rappers that are in their early forties right now, they came up on hip hop, but they also came up on all this other stuff because mo- you know most you ask a musician who's forty years old, you're like, what got you into hip hop? And they will invariably say Run DMC. Oh yeah, always. They oh, will, that's the oh, bottleneck in there. They will always say Run DMC. If you ask a guy who's in his late thirties, they will probably be like Big Daddy Kane, Rock him. Maybe cool G rap. You ask a guy who's in his early 30s, 
they will probably be Wu Tang, Nas, or Biggie, or Tupac, you know, and, and so on. So you have these guys that basically, you know, Fun Lotus is, I think, is like about to turn 30. So, you know, you ask him, it'll probably be like, well, Dre, you know, Dre, Dre also in that mix. I mean, for me, it was, Dre was the first, I, The Chronic was the first, I think, cassette album I ever really remember owning. Right. And, and an album you've written a lot about for yeah. the weekly as maybe best rap album. Oh, Classic yeah, Los right, Angeles, uh, the best yeah. Los Angeles I, album? I can come out and say that my editor really wanted to say that it was the best rap. I actually... They always want superlatives, don't they? It, I don't like that aspect of journalism. I tell you, know, and Ben Westoff is, I, I should say on the record is, and I'm not just saying this because it is on the record, but is, is a very intelligent man and an excellent editor and has given me more leeway than almost any editor I've ever had. I mean, there's a few actually editors that I'm, I'm very lucky right now to be at the point where... I have editors, you know, whether it's The Spin or MTV Hive or Pitchfork or LA Weekly, where they will pretty much let me do whatever I want. You know, they'll give you notes sometimes, but, you know, there's no, there's no idea too weird. But I guess I'm straying from the topic. But um, anyway, his point is that they came, everyone came up on hip hop, right? And then you got, I think a lot of people got to a point, and this is a recurring theme. I, you know, I talked to Daddy Kev a lot about Low and Theory, Lotus. Everyone got to about 2004, 2005, and they were like, what the fuck? Um, underground hip hop had sort of run its course. I think every, you know, you obviously that year it came, you know, you had a mad villain, but it wasn't like 98, 99, 2000, 2001, where you had like raucous records. You had Def Jux was like an, just starting and you had the end of Fondulum records in New York. And like, it was this just amazing kind of flourishing of underground hip hop. But you got to the point where underground hip hop is by essence a reactionary art form. And when you're a reactionary art form, you have two options. You can either take over the mainstream or, you know, you, you die. Be, or Because you, you can't be reactionary forever. You just end up looking like complaining and like, you know, like you're just like a like old man like screaming at cloud, you know, which is like a lot of underground rappers now. Like it's like, can you, I can't. Stuck on Venice Beach selling your wares at that point. Totally. If I hear a rapper in 2013 talking about whack MCs, I'm like, nope, no more. <laughs> like you are not going to get written about because you just talked about whack MCs. Like, like what is your imaginary boogeyman of whack MCs? And like, why do you care anymore at this point? Like, you know, like I understand. Like I understood, like back in the day when people were like, "I have thirteen dollars, it's gonna go to Wack MC or this like underground upstart," right? But now it's like, well, you can download whatever the fuck you want or stream everything. So like, if you like Wack MCs and you like, I mean, I'm reviewing a Tyga album right now. He is the wackest, but I kind of like some of Tyga songs. But uh, I mean, R- Rack City is a great song. You know, it's just it's what it is. It's like Mace. You know, like I was always like I, I always was kind of mystified too that there was this division between underground and mainstream because like maybe it was just being in LA my whole life, and there was obviously a very strong underground culture. I mean, Jurassic Five, Dr- Dialect Peoples, all those gr- you know all those groups. You know, I, I freestyle fellowship obviously before that, Good Life, but I liked both. I never understood why you couldn't like both, and I always felt that there was this dichotomy that was created by the media where it was like, yeah, like okay, so freestyle fellowship is not like. Dre or G Funk aesthetically, but Self Jupiter, who's a member of Freestyle Fellowship, did go to jail for ten years for robbery or five years for robbery, armed robbery, and Peace is like the craziest guy in the world and almost got signed to death row and the rumor was that Chug Knight thought he was too crazy. <laughs> so like and like Mike and I was like living on a bench, you know, and rapping about it. So it's like there's this weird, you know, but it's like they're at a health food store, so it's an easy angle. But anyways, again, another long-winded tangent. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> but um, thank you for listening, by the way. And uh, so, you know, there was this thing. So I think the beat scene and came out of that. I mean, if you look at Dame Funk, he was a guy who, uh, he was playing keyboards in Westside Connection Records and Mac 10 Records and, like, you know, all the priority records. And he came, he, at one point, he was he was <laughs> recruited to play on a Milli Vanilli record. Oh, was he going to do the one that, that uh, didn't happen. It was the comeback record? Oh, yeah, he and God. like you know, I did a cover story actually on him, a Wax Poetics, and he talks yeah. about it. And it was that he went out to Vegas, and like he's in Vegas, and like they were partying pretty hard. And he was like this young twenty-two year old guy, like just trying to make it. And he thought it was his big break. And I think Leon Silvers might have gotten him the job because he was working. Oh, really? The third was working. He was working with him a lot. He was a big, obviously a big fan of him. And yeah, he he, he ended up he got a job I think at like a like a like a save on or something. Oh, and he was really? like mopping floors because like he was getting paid because the sessions were happening. And I think he just and like one day he just had an epiphany and it, like a session got canceled. And he drove back in the middle of the night. 
So that's not hip hop, obviously. But you know, there is this hip hop underpinnings. A Lotus, he's a guy who came up on Dre, wanting no such thing. Told me he's like, I wanted to be like a Dre or a Neptunes or a Pharrell, and then they got to the point where it's like, okay, well, I'm not probably not gonna be a mainstream hip hop producer. And then they got into beats, and then. At the time, like, you know, the, the, there were not that many great rappers. And, like, who were they going to, you know, to give their beats to? I mean, so I think they were just like, fuck it. We'll just do it ourselves. And, you know, instrumental hip-hop, obviously, the tradition. You know, it wasn't, you know, you had a guy like Dabre was kind of doing stuff. But, and Dilla was doing his stuff. But even before that, you had a Shadow. You had all the Moak stuff, DJ Crush. Like, people were doing it, you know, pre few 73. So there was this tradition. And I think, like, L.A. also has an amazing uh, crate digging, like, tradition too i mean you have guys and there's like the story of la over the last 10 years is really like in terms of its like underground music communities there are a few like like a guy like egon who is the, was the general manager of stone throw now runs now again right you know he discovered all these old turkish soul records right so you're like okay well even in a vacuum you're like a guy's got records big deal but then he'll give some of them to madlib and then madlib will give them to his brother oh no and then you have an album like uh his turkish sampling album and then gaslam killer will get into these records via egon and then he'll incorporate you know he's of turkish descent and then he will incorporate this turkish psychedelia into his album with ganja sufi and his own solo album and next thing you know that's being played out for the world and there's a whole generation of kids so it kind of is all like a few you know peanut butter wolf doing it you know peanut butter wolf is another example of like why dame funk is right. nobody in their right mind would have given dame funk a deal <laughs> but like thank whatever that peanut butter wolf did because who is going to give a deal to a 36 year old dude who's never released an album whose claim to fame was was playing on West Side Connection records, right. but it was obviously, like, incredibly gifted and incredibly, like, you know, thoughtful and passionate artist. And that's, I think, you know, obviously my set's called Passion of the Weiss, which is, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but I do respond to the artists that are passionate because I, I think when I started it, I was just so... It's just alienated from you know this 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 reserve, and that's what I like about Dame Funk. It's it's a sincerity to it, and you know there's no there's no irony involved with Dame Funk. It's it's and in Lotus too, you know there's no there's no irony involved. Gaslam Killer, there's no irony involved. I think that's a very LA thing where it's like it's a little more sincere. Whereas in New York, you always think of like the arch hip ironic Lou Reed, and you think of LA, you have like a Jim Morrison who's totally not ironic and totally sincere, and you know. I love Lou Reed. I mean, who doesn't like the Velvet Underground? But I guess, you know, being... I miss that, and I, I like the fact that I think sincerity is coming back around. And you know, even, like, a James Blake. I'm not really a fan of James Blake, but I admire that he's becoming a big star based on, like, so sincere to the point of where I'm just like, hey. <laughs> Shlomo, I mean, another guy who's, like, very sincere. And I think a lot of people think he's ironic because, you know, he'll remix Pretty Boy Swag, but... Or whatever, Soldier Boy or Little B song. But, I mean, I think, you know, his music is heartfelt and passionate, and there's no, like... It's not like art brute, you know, that stuff doesn't last because at the end of the day, like, even Tyler's stuff, you know, is as arch and, and kind of sneering and kind of condescending as it can be. I mean, this new record, I mean, the song that hooked me on Tyler was, was the first song on Bastard, mm -hmm. where he's talking about, you know, it's that haunting piano key and talking about his dad that left him and like, you know, and you're just like, damn, that, that's just a wellspring of emotion coming up. And I think that's, the, you know, that's, that's timeless. I never thought about Los Angeles as an unironic place or a place that's hostile to irony or irony doesn't grow so well here but it doesn't does it i mean compared to new york especially you've got the yeah. slouching kids on melrose sure and you've got pockets i mean you, you definitely have pockets i mean yeah. like i mean echo park can like has its own i mean sometimes i go in there and i'm like what the fuck why is everyone dressing a 1900s parisian unicyclist but that's the last eight years only that's essentially last eight years right. yeah completely i mean and like hollywood's like lar by and large a cesspool too <laughs> but, i mean let's be honest what but people I mean, don't realize is you can avoid it totally. in los angeles i always tell people i'm like you have to carve out your own world because if you don't you're trapped by like th this like you're trapped by like i mean god i mean i remember growing up and like you'd have friends and they'd have a birthday party and you're at some hollywood club and i was like I'm gonna blow my brains out. Like, God, if I have to hear another Nelly song, I'm gonna fucking kill right. myself. Yeah, like, this really is the worst city in the world Just for that moment. You totally. think of it. Yeah. And it was probably in 2004 and 2005, <laughs> like, for sure. Right? Well, so, Hollywood. But I mean, I there's, there's another 400. I grew up 90 wanting, square miles. I grew up wanting to get the fuck out of L.A. I yeah. was like, why the fuck am I here? And I, I was like, going to ask, because everybody seems to have a period, if they're native to here, where it's like, this is an uncool place. Well, no matter how much they love it later, there's yeah. always that time. Well, I, you know, I grew up in West L.A., and then I went to Occidental College, and then I, I went to Occidental College. Only, I wanted to go to, like, different other... I wanted to go to, like... I went to UCSB. I got in the... UCSD. I got in the UCSB, and I was like, eh, UCSB, you're going to end up, like, with a drinking problem. UCSD... I went to UCSB, and I can tell you that happens. Yeah. I was like, I'll go, you go to UCSD, you'll end up bored. 
Um, you know, I want to go to Vassar, but my dad's like, that's a girl's school. I was like, dad, it's not a girl's school. And he's like, yeah, it used to be. I'm like, that's a bad reason. And he's like, it's expensive not sending you there. And then on Occidental, like, they recruited me to play baseball and basketball. So I was like, all right. They gave me a partial scholarship. So I was like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was like, my parents are like, we'll get you a car if you go, if you stay home. So I was like, okay, selling point, like, and you know, Southern California car culture, you know, mm-hmm. we'll go into high school without a car. Like you're like odd man out. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, in, at 17 years old, what the fuck did I know? So I was like, sure. Occidental, you know, like then like I was getting phone calls from the coach and it totally flattered my ego. But yeah, then, you know, I, I cocooned myself basically for four years at Occidental and then, you know, I graduated and was just trying to figure out what I, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I knew that, you know, I wanted to be a novelist. I mean, I still like harbor, like, you know, illusory dreams of, of, of being a novelist that some, someday, hopefully, I mean, I don't care if I give, I don't care if I'm 55 years old and I write the most critically pan novel in the fucking world. Like at least I did it. You still know you did it. On your deathbed, you I, know I, you I did it. I wrote a novel when in my the first half of my twenties and it was like, actually it was a very, um, it was about stuff that happened to me at Occidental, and that was, I think, sort of when I found my consciousness about mm-hmm. wanting to be a writer. Because I mean, I was a, I was like a jock, you know. It was like rap music and and basketball and baseball, and you know, I thought I was going to play professional baseball, and then I didn't realize. I don't think that everyone was on steroids at the time. <laughs> even, even then, there. Oh yeah, they were all on. St- half my team was on. Half the starting line. I was like, I was the cleanup hitter, and I was like, but I was like the only guy on the team that wasn't on steroids. And I was like, why aren't I hitting as many home runs? I was like hitting. I had like a three seventy average, but I was like. Why are you not hitting home runs? And then I was Why like, Why am I so much less angry than those guys? Totally. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I would definitely. I was like, eh, it's probably good that I didn't take steroids because right. I probably would have broken something because I was. I had a really bad temper playing mm-hmm. baseball because baseball is not a sport if you're a perfectionist, you know, because you're just like, you know, you fail so much. But so, you know, I did that, and then we had a an accident on my baseball team. We, all these guys pledged a fraternity, and I I pledged actually my freshman year, and then. I'll never forget the first day I go to the fraternity. It's like, it's totally straight out of National Lampoon's Animal House. You're like, I can't believe something is still like this in 2000. It was like, what? I guess this was the end of 2000, 1999, so, so long ago. But, you know, it was like, everyone's like playing like, they're like, bro, Social D, what's up? And I'm like, what is Social D? Where is Wu-Tang? Like, why do you not have any outcasts? Like, what is happening in this frat house? And they're like, rap. And, like, it was, like, I'm sure, like, I think that there were a couple black guys in the frat, but well, maybe one. It was, like, not, like, happening. Not, not enough. Not a, Yeah, it was not. It was, it was really, like, uh, I'd never, I don't think I'd ever been around that many, like, bro, white bros. Because, right. like, you know, growing up in L.A., like, you're not, you know, it's, it's pretty mixed. And, like, you know, I played basketball, so it wasn't, like, you're around bros. Like, everyone's, like, you know, growing up, like, we're bumping the Jay-Z record and the Tribe Called Quest, you know, and... Whatever it was, Bone Thugs and Harmony, and sure. you know, woo. So, <laughs> Jermaine Dupree is left in 1472, uh, which I did not own, but I listened to too many times. But yeah, and then I got there and I was like, fuck. And then it was, so I pledged this fraternity, de pledged the fraternity at the end of the semester, before, right before becoming active, because I was like, fuck this, this is the worst thing I've ever done. And it was just, you know, it was, everyone was walking alike, talking alike, you know, it was like a Patty Duke show on, you know, on steroids. <laughs> and then we ended up, uh, Two years later, this whole freshman class pledged to my baseball team. And long story short, there was a hazing. They sent these kids on a hazing trip to Vegas. One of my, uh, one of the guys driving the car fell asleep at the wheel as a freshman. He killed our starting shortstop as a freshman, 18 years old. Another one of my friends is nearly paralyzed. Um, and it was actually like they thought I was going to die. And I, 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 it still probably has a little bit of brain damage, honestly. Um, another guy, you know, had his spine shattered. It's a really tragic accident. And I ended up starting to write a novel kind of about... The idea was basically, what if you were the driver? Yeah. Because it was kind of in a way to be cathartic, because I was, you know, we were all in a lot of pain, you know, it was, it was our, our teammate died, and, you know, you had the kid um, who crashed the car, you know, coming back to school, like, being like, do you think I killed, you know, Greg was his name, yeah. and, you know, and it was just the most awful thing that had ever happened to anyone I ever knew, it happened to me, or it happened to me, or anybody around me, and, you know, I, so I, it kind of galvanized me to start writing a book, and I sort of dabbled with it, and, you know, I ended up, it took me five years, and I finished it, and then... Yeah. Uh, was that the first writing you did that was self-motivated, non-school, like pen to paper writing? Yeah, that was, uh, and I was, you know, I, I, I had just gotten into, I think, I, I had a girlfriend at the time who lived up in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. so she lived in Alameda, so whenever I'd visit her, we'd go drive into the San Francisco and go to City Lights, and, mm-hmm. you know, I, I had a friend that, you know, was, I, I don't know, like my, my dad's like a tax lawyer, and like my mom is like, you know, runs a baby boutique, and like, she, there were no books in my house, there were no books, there were no movies. You had one of those houses. 
houses. Yeah, there were no books, there were no movies, there were no records. Zero. Like, I'm, I'm like, literally, I think the only book that I ever read in my parents' house was The Firm. What was your... What was, <laughs> like, The Firm. What was, your, what was your parents' form of non-Grisham entertainment, like, for themselves? God. Or were they just, like, working all the time? My dad would, my dad would basically work until, like, 9 p.m. at night, and then he'd come home and probably watch, like, uh, baseball highlights or something. And then my mom... Like I don't know what my mom did. Like I was bored. I don't know. She, they would work though. My parents were like a family of like you know maybe it's it's like I'm sure it's some sort of like Jewish immigrant thing passed down for like hundreds of you know for right. however long. But it's like you know it's 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 work. You know it's like me too. Like I don't have a TV in my house. I mean I, I watch a while like illegally stream stuff, but I don't watch much TV. I mean I try. Me neither, because you know it could get you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, nowadays it's probably the most vital art form, though. Unfortunately, right. you know, if you think about it, like I, you know, I wanted to be a novelist, and then you get older. I, I, I it was the guy who wrote Departed had a really. I remember reading about five years ago when Departed came out, and he was like, I spent my twenties wanting to be a novelist until I turned thirty something and realized novelists don't really exist. <laughs> and like, obviously, they do. You know, you, uh, Juno Diaz is great. I think Michael Chabon is still. I mean, I didn't. I liked Telegraph Avenue. I didn't really like... I didn't love it the way I loved, like, Wonder Boys or, uh... Women Wonder Boys or even Mysteries of Pittsburgh I really liked. And Cavalier Clay is obviously excellent. But, you know, there's not... There's not... There's the path of being a novelist. You know, unless you're, like, an MFA. It doesn't exist. And I didn't like that because... I didn't want to be a, a, an MFA type novelist. Right. Like, I mean, I mean, like total respect to anyone that's doing it. Like, and you know what? There's a degree of envy that goes with that. I mean, I would, I would love. I mean, I would have probably gone honestly if my parents would have paid for me to get an MFA, and they were like, you know, here's forty grand or sixty grand or whatever, probably sixty, seventy grand. You know, go to whatever school, and we'll pay for your MFA. You know, I probably would have got a master's in history if they would have paid, you know, English. But I didn't. I was like, God, do I want to be seventy thousand dollars in debt at twenty five right. with a right. job where you get paid forty thousand dollars a year? It doesn't make any sense. So I just didn't do it, and I was like, Well, um, you're gonna have to do something to pay your bills, and I, you know, this is the long way into basically how I started writing. But I, I was writing this novel at the time, and I was like, Of course, like you know, everyone's writing this novel at the time, and. You know, of course, you think your novel is like going to be like it's. You're like, you know, I'd read, I'd read like Herman Melville and Moby Dick, and I'd be right. like, oh, totally, you're just going to write Moby Dick at like 24, right. just delusional. But I, you know, people always ask me like, what's the best thing to do to be a writer? I'm like, have a healthy streak of delusion, right. and that will be the best thing you can possibly have because you don't know any better. But do you, I mean, you look at it now, and I, I never have. I suppose, like you, my living mostly comes from writing. I've never tried writing fiction, I think. You know, you either have that inclination or you don't. Um, but would, would you have wanted to write a huge novel at 24? Would you want something you wrote that young to have swept the zeitgeist, and that's what you're known for, even at this age, even 20, 30 years down the line? I think of, I mean, this is not a band I listen to a lot, but yeah. uh, Silverchair, yeah. uh, Daniel Jones, uh, the, the lead of the lead dude of Silver, lead Australian dude of Silverchair. Totally. He always talks about how he regrets that Frog Stomp that he made at fifteen is now what he's known for. Like, I wish that wasn't a hit. You I know what about, I mean? I think about that a lot, actually. And um, you know, there's there's contrasting examples. I mean, Philip Roth is probably my favorite writer, and he wrote Goodbye Columbus when he was probably twenty five. And mm. not to say that I'm like going to be, you know what I mean? The chances are I was not going to be Philip Roth. So, I mean, no one's going to be... I, I actually don't think... I, I, I'm pretty certain that we'll probably never produce another writer as good as someone like that again, or a Joan Didion, because I think that our, our, we're not in a... Our educational system is too flawed, and I think it just isn't that... You know what I mean? You're going you're, you're gonna to be too distracted. You're not going to have that kind of focus. Your kids are not going to... I mean, maybe I could be completely wrong. And their books are not going away. You can always read Philip Roth. Well, like, thing. you still have to compete against Philip you Roth, even be, if he was dead. Totally. He's alive. Like, why would retired. anyone... And it's like... Why? Why, uh, why would anyone buy my book when they could read American Pastoral? Like, I mean, why would anyone... Or, you know, it's like a slouching towards Bethlehem. I mean, or a white album. You're just like, damn, that's right. just incredible. It's just a... It's magic, you know? That's true of all art, right? I mean, it's like, I'm going to record an album, but people could listen to The Chronic again or listen to my Shlomo album. actually said that really recently. And oh, he was really? like, I was like, what did you... Um, and I, I'm a big fan of Shlomo. And he was like... He's like, yeah. I was like, when did you kind of take... I'm like, you took a real creative leap between your first and second record. Like, it's pretty much like your first record is you. You clearly know what... You clearly had an instinct towards music and sound and aesthetic and whatever. But you took this leap. And he's like, yeah, because I realized that, like, every fucking critic was comparing me against, like, the greatest albums ever. And I was like, right. shit. 
I have to do it. But I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the beauty. I mean, I think if you, I think that's, I guess if there was like a crossover between like sports and and music for me or writing, excuse me, it's that competitive streak. It's just everything that I want. I want you, you just want to keep getting better. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of people that, I think there's a temptation. Whereas, you know, we we go back to go back to the original question. You have Brady St. Ellis too. Brady St. Ellis wrote, you know, less than zero. He was 23, 24, 22 even. And, and he's still less than zero guy. He's still the less than zero like guy. 50. Yeah. And he's an interesting example. And I feel like he probably would have been the great writer of his generation if he hadn't been famous that young. Because I think there's a thing that once you get that fame, especially as a writer, you're no longer able to disappear in a situation. You know, you're no longer able to, like, people really talk to you because they're like, oh, you're the writer. You're, you know, unless you're like Joan Didion, because there's a famous quote, I think it's the start of Such Toys Bethlehem about her, you know. She's just so neurotic and tiny and that no one ever thinks of her as, like, you know, but she's always selling somebody out. Mm -hmm. But when you're, like, a novelist, I mean, when you're Brady St. Ellis, I mean, or Hank Moody, as I should probably say. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, he just, and he kind of, I think, froze. I think think you freeze. I think think that's, um, that's, it's nice I guess I would like the money. <laughs> like that would have been. It would be nice to have written a book at 24 where you're getting royalties for the rest of your life. Right. You know, I always think about that. I mean, it just depends on the kind of person you are. Like, I think if uh, if you're just, it's. I mean, it, it, it depends how much you have to say. Like, you know, I think I don't know how much Brady Stills had to say. He's. Got, I mean, if you listen to him speak, he's obviously a brilliant guy. But you're like I don't. You're like there's no philosophy underneath it. It's it's nihilism, Bryce and Ellis, and mm-hmm. that's the theme that runs through it. And if you don't, whereas like Philip Roth, you're like or, or Neff Scott Fitzgerald, you know, somebody who's one of my favorite. I mean, my cat is named after him. But I mean, I was like the biggest F. Scott Fitzgerald fan when I. Yes. I mean, I've had that cat for like eight years now, and mm-hmm. when I got him, I was like enraptured with. I was a big like the book that I wrote actually was kind of mod- loosely modeled on this side of paradise, which you know when I read when I was 22, like. You know, right. but even got to model on something, and if you're totally. going to model, you might as well choose the best. Yeah, well, the funny thing is too, like you know, you look at it and you're like, I, I didn't understand this. Like, I was like, oh, I thought I could write like a, a, the set of paradise, and like then obviously you'd be some sensation, but you don't realize like, uh, no, if they did it, and it's like the set of paradise would probably be girls. <laughs> really? You know, I mean, I don't like girls. Like, I'm not a fan of girls, but. Uh, the show. Right. Uh, like, that's another show I haven't seen, but strong opinions. That's what's putting me off. The opinions are too strong. Um, I don't care about any of the characters. Oh, okay. And I don't... And, you know, I, I guess there's people that can be okay with, what, like, liking a show with unlikable characters, but, you know, to you know, I, I keep on quoting things because, you know, I like to, tell, you know, people are smarter than me, so I'm like, might as well steal from them. Sure. Um, but, like, there's that, you know, the Oscar Wilde quote, and he's like, if you're going to be honest, be funny, or else people are going to want to kill you. <laughs> and I don't think Lena Dunham's that funny. Mm. So, you know, if you don't think she's funny, then you're probably going to want to kill her. But if you do think she's funny, then you're willing to forgive all of her sins. I mean, mm. Girls is, well, the, the first few episodes, I didn't see it after the fourth episode. I found myself hate watching the show. Sure. It was like, felt like, I don't like, you know, it felt like literally like having hate sex, and I was like, <laughs> oh, that's the worst <laughs> feeling on earth and like I've never been like a guy that does you know what I mean I've never been a guy that's like you know it's not in me to do that so I was like I have to stop doing this because I do not I'm not I mean I have I'm not I'm no longer a hateful person I've sort of that's been the nice thing about getting older is you sort of um you can I think maturity is probably taking the things you hate and laughing about them mm. versus taking the things you hate and like wanting to fulminate against the evils of the world (laughs) but then again if you ask me about like uh uh, like American, if you ask me about like American economy and like American culture, I probably would you know have a more pessimistic answer. So. Speaking of hate going away, when did you stop hating Los Angeles? You mentioned you thought it was bad for a while growing up, and now I mean, you, you clearly don't. So I think it was two thousand nine, two thousand. I think you know, like honestly, like I don't want to say it was a result of the Low End Theory because it wasn't, but it was around the time I discovered the Low End Theory. Maybe a little for those who don't know, um, not from here, about what that is. The Lone Theory is sort of, um, I like, think of it as like the hip-hop diaspora, kind of. It's like a hub, you know, or Seneca, like a, just a place, it's like a, like a, it's hard to say without being hyperbolic, because it's not what it was when it, for when I first got there, and it's still great, you know, honestly, like, I went two weeks ago, and I saw John Wayne, and he, Mm -hmm. this is rapper John Wayne, he's on Stone's Throw. And he came up with Scoop DeVille, and he, you know, there Scoop John Wayne's from La Habra. Scoop DeVille grew up in LA. His dad's kid Frost, famous uh, Latino rapper, and they killed it. And I had the best time, and I was like, man, like I just it kind of rekindled like my love. But you know, it was a place basically where all these beat makers came, and it was people that had kind of got alienated from from 
the the mainstream variant of hip hop, but without the orthodoxy of the underground. So it was sort of like trying to form something new. And there was something really exciting. And there still is something exciting about it. I mean, obviously, you go there now, it's an hour-long wait. It's in Lincoln Heights. It's in this part of town that no, no, pretty much no hipster kid would ever go to. I'd never, you know, I'd only been there once when I was in like the the in high school, like to for Christmas. Like we like did this whole Christmas thing. We we're playing with like you know, bring gifts to you know underprivileged kids and that whole thing, which yeah. was cool. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was great. There's like a photo of me in my yearbook, like like mobbed by like you know, like it's it's. I'm sure if I ever do anything worthwhile, I hopefully. Someone would be like, that was hilarious. You looked goofy. <laughs> Why is your hair so short? Um, but, yeah, no. And then I, I just, I don't know. Like, I just, the culture right now is, I like, there's, all, there's uh, you know, another, like, famous quote where it's like, you know, you open up the gates of a country and you can judge a country by opening up the gates and seeing what happens. And it's sort of like L.A., like, you know, the gates are, are obviously open. And you're getting all these, like, there's something happening where you're getting all these interesting musicians coming here. Like, I was thinking about Peaking Lights, you know, they're a kind of a dub, kind of, have you ever listened to their stuff? I, I know I've heard it. I don't know if I could identify, but it's more like every name you mention, yeah. I know I've heard. Yeah. Like, I can guarantee you I've heard all these people. It's like dub reggae crossed with, like, like l- lover's rock kind of stuff. Like, maybe like a massive, you know, it's very um, slinky. It sounds... Like kind of no, nothing like almost I've heard. I can't think of a band that sounds like maybe like dub reggae across like a beach house, like very slug mazzy star, like a slow kind of dubby. But um, you know they just moved here, and then even like I'm doing a story right now for the Washington Post on Moonbaton, mm-hmm. and, and like you know Moonbaton's like fine. Like I actually thought I would hate it a lot more than when I saw it out live, and I was like this is the worst. And then I, I went there and I was like eh, it's actually like not that bad. And then there was something. It didn't feel like cultural appropriation because the guy who founded it is this guy Dave Nada, who's uh, actually, uh, I think his family is Ecuadorian, but I, I might be wrong, so don't quote me on it. But they, there, he, um, he was obviously Latin, so he had like it was a roots in it, and it was you know mixing Dutch house with uh, reggaeton, and so anyway, so all these DJs then moved to you know they they were all living now in this cluster in downtown, and they all moved from Washington D.C. to come to L.A. So I think right now you know and, and then. It's still cheaper than New York. I feel New York kind of priced itself out, unfortunately, which is sad. And, like, I mean, obviously you can live in Brooklyn where it's cheaper, but, you know, I always I thought about living in Brooklyn. I could never afford New York as a writer, you know, but... It needs to have another 70s-style apocalypse. Then you can move in, but, you know, good luck. I know, I know. I'm really hoping for that to happen. I would like to live in the Lower East Side for $400 a month, right. you know. It would be great, but, um, you know, worrying about getting mugged, but at the same time... I don't know. Like, I feel like L.A. is still reasonably priced compared to, compared to like, a New York City, a San Francisco even. And I don't know. There's kind of a, a good mood right now. I think the culture finally has caught up with the fact that, you know, it was it used to be a, a company town. You know, it was, it was Hollywood. It was Hollywood. You had, your, you had Hollywood, your South Central, you had East L.A., and everyone was in their own little box, you know. And now – and then you have, like, your, your Santa Monica West Side, whatever. Right. But everyone was kind of – and now I feel like – you're getting places like Highland Park is it's you know it's mixing Echo Eagle Rock is mixing Echo Park is mixing. Not to say that gentrification is some you know wonderful panacea. It's totally obviously not. Right. But I, would there, you even call it gentrification? I mean, it's it seems to me more like people are everyone's going everywhere in yeah. Los Angeles. I mean, there's some people are quote unquote gentrifier types. I mean, wherever I move, I don't have that much money, but I'll be seen as gentrifying just because of what I look like, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that too, like, you know what I mean? Like, I was I was at a show last night in, uh, or last weekend in Echo Park and I was seeing this band called Regal Deagle who were actually, they just moving, act, they just moved to LA and now they're moving back to New York but, you know, the fact that they came to LA whereas 10 years ago people would be like, oh, LA, what a cultural cesspool and now it's like, you know, I remember like when Steven, when Steve Aoki was dropping records and that was the sound of LA Electronic before Flying Lotus and them right. and that totally changes and, st- you know, you have a Stone's Throw and then you have a Tell the Creator pop up and then you have a Kendrick Lamar pop up and you have a school, you know, schoolboy Q, and then you have all these different things popping up, and then it sort of it rebranded the city. But even as somebody living there, you know, you have this food culture that's all of a sudden sprung up, which is a little obnoxious, honestly. Like, but it's delicious. But the old, the old food cultures are still here, and yeah. like they're still good. You can just you could ignore the trucks that you don't like. You totally, know? yeah. And I mean, there's like Ricky's fish tacos that you know you can have on to you can follow on Twitter, and it's the best fish taco in the world, and. You know, it's three dollars. Right. And you can, I, I live on Eighth Street, so there's like people set up their grills on the corner every night, and like you just eat there, and right? It's delicious, and you find what truck you like, and it's yeah. amazing. And it's not. Um, I haven't felt any kind of. I mean, like the, like I was saying last week, and I went to the show in Echo Park, and like there were totally some like like dudes in, from in, in the hood who like who were you know neighborhood 
dudes that had probably they had been raised there and they're probably in their early 20s and like you know their family had probably been there for 40 years and they were totally like they were like you know they were probably trying to start shit with us but nothing happened you know but and then like I was I turned to someone I was like I'd probably fucking hate us too you know and they, you can't blame them for you know coming people coming to your neighborhood driving up the prices but at the same time it's safer I mean LA, I don't know if you saw the statistics today but it was like LA had another like it was like, it was like a 14% crime drop in the last year right it's, it feels I mean I go to a lot of cities and this one feels the safest of all of them and in the 90s it was like terrifying oh, like gosh. you were like really you know you know I, I talked about it with my girlfriend because she's like she's younger and just moved to LA like only a few, like a few years ago and I was like if you were here in the 90s like it was like it didn't matter what part of town you lived in like you know I remember my mom would come downtown and like she you know to buy she, she had this little business where she would like do gift baskets and she had a store and like you know and she'd go to buy supplies downtown and like you'd be literally stepping over homeless people everywhere right, and right. it was it was really you know and the riots obviously happened and you, you think about that and you think of like you know I just bought uh, the Mike Davis book City of Courts yes, to, yes. to reread um, I read some of it in college I didn't finish it but um, it was just for a class and I'm going to read the whole thing but I have a feeling it's going to be totally anachronistic and like that vision of LA like this dystopian nightmare is not true I mean although traffic has probably got worse so maybe at a point mm-hmm. now, that's one of the books people use to put their to place their minds in Los Angeles for better or for worse yeah. but since I'm talking to you what what albums what are the Los Angeles albums you would foist on somebody who wants to prepare themselves for this city I mean a love forever changes a yeah. uh, a uh, the chronic I say chronic doggy style forever changes for sure I mean LA Woman 100% I wrote a big cover story for right. um, LA Weekly on LA Woman and that to me is like I mean that album it's like the LA I always think about that because that actually I mean I don't know if you caught that story but yeah, yeah. it it was I started it out on the cover of Santa Monica and uh and La Cienega, which is right where I grew up, right around there. And I must have driven past that intersection like a thousand times. And I had no idea the Doors Workshop was there. I had, you know, there's like a little tiny placard. And like, it's right next to a cuckoo. <laughs> like, like, it's like, it's like this little, like, Spanish building that, like, right. is totally unassuming. And then, like, it's right across the street from, like, a pet groomer. And then right. like, Alan Ed's Auto Sound. And, like, the Ramada Inn was, like, the Sandy Kofax. And you're like, wow. And, like, all, it used to be all these strip clubs and, like, right. lesbian bars and, like, this gritty, grimy. And now it's, like, you know, frozen yogurt chops you know and but it, it, LA Woman gets you to like a gritty imaginary Los Angeles I mean I'm trying to think what else would be an amazing I mean you could probably I would like to say there's got what other I mean Frank Zappa's early stuff maybe one of those we're only in it for the money gets the degree of oh I would say Frank Zappa's we're only in it for the money and the new Ariel Pink album Mature Themes mm. both strike the absurdity of Los Angeles because mm. if you take Los Angeles too seriously you're failing Really? What, what, what happens if you do that? You, you know, you get absorbed into, you know, you become like, you either could become like a Hollywood people. I think a lot of transplants get, like, I think the kids are native to L.A. You grow up, I always, like, you know, people are like, like, I think, I always say this, I think every girlfriend I've ever had has left L.A. Like, has been like, I like get them, bring them the fuck out of here. And, like, I've had a lot of, like, wonderful girls I met over the years, um, many of them friends, who just left. And, like, I've always said, like, yeah, I've probably never met that many great girls that have said, like, I love L.A., I want to stay here. I mean, there are, totally exist, and I, I know several, but, like, most of the wonderful girls that I've met are always like, I need to get the fuck out. Because they came here, because they're transplants, or because, or what? Um, I always say that if you grew up here, it's like growing up in Mexico, uh, the tap water, you can drink the tap water. Right. But if you come here and you drink, you know, if you go to Mexico and you drink the tap water and you're, like, a gringo, you get Montezuma's Revenge. <laughs> and I think L.A. will give you Montezuma's Revenge. Right, if you, you know, if you go in, because you're, like... I think a lot of people get caught up in like the oh I have to look like that or I have to be that or I have to make all this money or this or the, what is I have, to, I have to be a member of the Soho House or whatever bullshit you're like I don't even know what that is Ocean Forty One or whatever <laughs> yeah if you grow up in LA you know that shit because you know people that are into that and like you're just like I mean for me I grew up you know I, I would go to all those places when I was a kid like you know twenty one twenty two I wouldn't go regularly you know I mean it'd be somebody somebody would have a birthday and you'd know somebody and you'd have to go to like the Pally House or whatever stupid place you know Moomba or whatever fucking place it was at the sure. time <laughs> it's always it's always changing it's always an interchanging series of like you know Casbah or like you know Bungalow or whatever <laughs> it's always some stupid right. you know uh, but you'd go and I just was like yeah like I, I always liked that um, line from Citizen Kane where it's like I just want to be everything they hate you know and right, uh, right. but it's, isn't that true for every city I mean you 
If you take Los Angeles too seriously, you become a monster. If you take New York too seriously, you become a monster. Yeah, a different you're, kind. You're, getting on, oh, you're right. Yeah. Or if you, even if you take San Francisco too seriously oh, yeah. and you live there, I mean, maybe above all there, you become a monster. Oh, yeah. I think South Park really got that with the smug <laughs> thing. I mean, I love San Francisco. I lived up there for like two months, and I would have, I probably would have ended up moving to San Francisco because there's the place. I, I think there's something about San Francisco, the energy that you feel. It, it gets New York, but it doesn't have the immensity of New York, and it has the ocean right there, and it's not as cold. And right. Something about that like salt air like from every angle and the view of the water at every angle. I mean, it's an amazing city, but it's not a city if you want to make a living as a, as a freelance writer. Right. I mean, it's really only L.A. or New York, which is sad because, you know, I... Um, I have an old man kind of uh, writing mentor who's an, uh, he's he's a, one of these uh, writers who's kind of fallen through the cracks. I think a little bit of history, mm-hmm. but you know his name is Herbert Gold. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with Herbert Gold. I might be, but uh, it would introduce the audience as um, well. Yeah, well, Herbert Gold. You know, I first found out about him because I was like obsessed with the Beats when I was in college. Like obsessed. You know, I must have read every Kerouac book, every Ginsberg poem for Langetti, mm-hmm. Gary Snyder. I mean, go go down the line. You know, right. like when I interviewed Michael McClure for that LA Woman story, I was like so excited to interview Michael mm-hmm. McClure. And Herbert Gold was um, regarded as Jack Kerouac's, like, nem- nemesis. So, like, they would always list, they would always be, like, uh, Norman Potterettes, Herbert Gold, and, like, I forget the third. Oh, well, Kenneth Rex Roth. Mm-hmm. Those were, like, the three they'd always be like, and, and the Beats had rivals. And it was, like, <laughs> Kenneth Re- and Kenneth Rex Roth, it was mainly that they didn't like Kerouac, because everyone, I think, liked Allen Ginsberg. Mm-hmm. Herbert Gold was actually really good friends with Allen Ginsberg. He went to Columbia with both Kerouac and Ginsberg. He's 89 years old. He lives in San Francisco now. I'm actually friends with his son, Ethan Gold, mm-hmm. who... He's a really talented musician. Um, you guys should look. If you're into like, guitar or music, he's he's a really good musician and lives in L.A. And, you know, he told me one day, he's like, yeah, my dad was a writer. He's like, you've never heard of him. I was like, try me. And he was like, Herbert Gold. I was like, I know exactly who your dad is. And so then, you know, when his dad would come to lunch, I would meet him. And then, you know, we became kind of struck up a friendship. And, you know, he doesn't have the Internet or anything. But I would, you know, when I'd visit, go to San Francisco, I'd always visit him and get Chinese food. And I'd just talk to him and just, you know pick his brain for everything and you know he'd always be like you know he made he i remember he told me a story he was like when he would write an article for playboy in the 60s and he wrote a book called fathers which was like a big that was his big hit it was like 1967 and it was kind of a chronicle about growing up like you know with a, a dad who didn't want to be a writer in cleveland and the 1960s immigrant father and that was his big sensation and you know at the time and he, you know, he's in electric cool at acid test herb tom wolf describes him having it he's still resentful of it he described him as having an aftershave smile <laughs> which is just like the greatest describe so tom, you're like tom wolf you're so good <laughs> and um this is so mean and um yeah you know he he ended up he and he, he's wrote uh he wrote actually a book called i think it's called walk on the west side mm-hmm. and i just bought it actually but my girlfriend stole it from me so i haven't got to read it yet but i read the intro and it's, it's really good and it's, it's actually it, on topic because it's essays about california oh, cool. and and the west but you know i remember when i go up to san francisco he's like you know he's encouraging me to move up to san francisco and i, I was trying to explain it to him he's like well and you write a letter for cal oh he, so anyways he would tell me when he read an article for playboy he would have I think it would be like a, like a good sized one would be enough to buy himself a car, and like a long one would be enough to buy himself a convertible. And you're like, yeah, okay. You're like, good. I get. <laughs> sure, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, but now, I mean, you probably would get. You probably was two grand at the time, and I'm sure in 1967 or it's 1972, two grand must have been 20 grand, and now it's like you get paid two grand for the same story. Right. I right. mean, I think writing and cocaine are the only two things that have gone down in the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't do cocaine, so right. you so know, you're stuck with, stuck with writing. writing. Yeah. <laughs> I've been speaking with Jeff Weiss. He writes the Bizarre Ride column in the LA Weekly. He also writes a lot about music, musicians, for them and for many other publications. Founder of the site Passion of the Wise Podcaster and more. Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everybody who backed Season 3 on Kickstarter, including Paige Calvert, Jonathan Crow, Douglas Dollars, Paul Doyle, John French, Eric Graham, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Kimberly Hahn, Carl Haley, Stefan Halperin, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Matthew Licky, Mr. Munvirzi, Rob Montz, Lindsay Muniak, Daniel Murphy, Aidan Nolman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Blake Riley, Rob Schultz, Cam Smith, Small Demons, Todd Shimoda, Kevin Smokler, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.